Well, uh, welcome back, uh, Malcolm Galloway, uh, to Progressive Rock Central. Thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule. This guy is constantly working on new music and new material. And he's got two albums we're going to try to talk about today, The Confidence Trick and his solo project, uh, Patterns. And uh, we'll also talk a little bit about uh, live shows that he's doing and what, what's coming next. Because, uh, like I say, he's always working on something. So, welcome. Thank you very much for all your support. All right. Um, so, first off, uh, another wonderful album of favorites. Uh, I like the subject of the album. Uh, so many of us have that overconfidence in our lives that causes us to um, make huge mistakes. Then, when it comes to governments, militaries, or companies, it can cost lives and livelihoods. And so thank you for addressing the subject so well. And from a musical standpoint, I mean, people write books about these things, but you've done it very well with music. And uh, it's so timely uh, shortly after the global pandemic, uh, which, as we all admit, should have been controlled much better than it was. Uh, do you want to say anything about that first? Or about the pandemic? Um, or well, just, you know, the whole uh, concept of the album? And oh, because so for quite a while, I've been interested in overconfidence. It started, um, I used to be a, um, a neuropathologist, a medical school teacher. And one of the things I taught and researched about was how people make errors in diagnosis. And often the problem wasn't so much a lack of knowledge, but excessive certainty and overconfidence. People making a, a hasty opinion and then sticking by it, despite any evidence to the contrary. So this excessive certainty, overconfidence, um, I was regularly seeing as a, as a cause of diagnostic problems. And then after you know, reading about that, researching and teaching about it, then seeing that same issue coming up in lots of other contexts, um, as you're mentioning, you know, politics, military, uh, where lives really are at, uh, at stake. Um, so we, I think we live in a society where confidence is really celebrated, but the dangers of overconfidence are underappreciated. So this this album explores these kind of cognitive errors from a variety of perspectives, some historical, some allegorical science fiction stories, um, basically all around that theme. Definitely. Well, in the very first track on this album, uh, Silence is a Statement, mm -hmm. is, is the perfect way to open up. Um, we cannot stand silent when the world is standing on the verge of destruction, let alone all the other calamities that will happen because of our silence. Um, do you want to talk about that? And I know uh, part of this deals with World War II and, and what happened, yeah. then, but it's it's unfortunately happening today. And uh, go ahead. Yeah, so um, the idea of silence is a statement. It, it's a song about the dangers of not saying anything when awful things are happening and that silence being assumed to be tacit approval. So for awful things to happen, you don't necessarily need huge numbers of evil people, but you need a lot of um, people who are willing to keep quiet or look away. And, and often the, the risk of um, not staying silent is substantial for the individual. I'm not underestimating the the dangers for the people in some of those historical circumstances. Um, but often, if we don't tolerate injustice earlier, um, we could stamp out some of these uh, things rather than keeping making the same historical mistakes. So in the, the centerpiece track in the album, Refuge, is um, an instrumental about my great-grandmother's experience of escaping um, the Holocaust. And... Um, there's obviously the hugely negative side of the story of the um, overt evil of the regime involved, but there's also the hope from um, 
a village protected her. They gave her sanctuary in a in an attic of a barn, and she did so in for the village, and they looked after her. But everyone in the village was risking their life to keep this a secret. Uh, and these were strangers, but they took her in and, and saved her. So in the most hideous circumstances, we can see the worst of humanity and also the best. So, that, that, yeah, that's kind of like the center of the album. And then there are these stories radiating off from it. Um, and perhaps if more people had uh, stood up to say, no, they don't agree when dehumanization first starts with a group, uh, then you can avoid going as far down uh, the line as happened in the 30s and 40s. Definitely. Um, back where I started is, uh, again, talking about history repeating itself. And uh, in some ways, uh, we're seeing that. I mean, we see it constantly. Um, thanks again for uh, Catherine's flute. It is just yeah. awesome. It was great on, um, on the last album. And uh, they, as I listened to it again today, I realized it seemed like it, you had cut it back, but no, it, there's still a lot of prominent uh, uses. Mm, yeah. She does a great job. Did, did she also sing background vocals as well? Uh, she did backing vocals on Back Where I Started and in the kind of big choir bit at the end of All Empires Fall. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that or move in? Um, um, I mean, about about which one, sorry? Just uh, back where, where I started or... Oh, back where I started. Yeah, that story. Uh -huh. It's a kind of allegorical science fiction story. Um, I mean, it's not based on an existing uh, story, but it's a kind of short story idea. It's somebody who has a time machine, keeps going back in time to try and make things better, but every time they do they actually end up making it worse and keep then going back to try and fix things and it just getting worse and worse and worse. You can't play with history either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it not, you know, the, the protagonist is doing the best of intentions, but it doesn't uh, work out. And uh, I suppose the hint might be that it, it's probably easier to avoid the awful things happening in the first place. In a sense, yeah, we don't have a time machine, but we do have history, which is not you know not quite the same but does give us a hint of what happens in different circumstances and we should be able to see the consequences of some of the things we do and still seem to ignore them i think there was kind of a unwritten law or maybe it was a written law in uh, star trek that kind of addressed that you know don't mess with you know when you're doing time travel don't mess mm -hmm. with what happened in the past yeah for those of you that are Trekkie fans, good morning. <laughs> um, end of the line uh, op opens up a three-track uh, symphonic and at times cinematic showcase. Do you want to talk mm. a little bit about that? I, I heard a lot of Lamb Lies down in Broadway kind of influence, and it's one of my favorite albums. Uh, go ahead. So, um, end of the line is that's another sort of science fiction allegorical short story the idea is uh, a world where it's never explained why or how but everybody lives in just one street you know it's just one long line and nobody knows whether it carries on forever or if it has an end or if it loops back on itself and people used to have horrific wars between the different viewpoints or something that they essentially couldn't prove anyway um, but uh, over time it's become a sort of taboo to even mention any of those things there's, some, there's this very odd thing going on in that world but that just nobody mentions because previously it's led to such um, problems and somebody decides that they're going to try and find out so they they um, they basically set off walking in one direction um, and it, eventually they they lose their memory and don't know whether they've come back to where they started or not. So it doesn't work out. It's a bit of a depressing ending, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's Mark's favorite track on the album. 
um, Mark has in the bassist. And um, Catherine wrote the chord sequence uh, for that one. Um, uh, that was nice. There's quite a lot of interplay between the flute and guitar yeah. on there, which I enjoy. Yeah. All right. Um, Perky Pet is an amazing uh, laser like uh, display of synthesizer and keyboards, which I love. Uh, and an Emerson Banks fan would love that song. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, that's an instrumental. That's one of the ones that's most fun for me. I mean, it, um, you know, a lot of the album is quite, you know, serious themes and things. This one is a bit of. Uh, light relief and uh, fun. Also, for me, listening, it's difficult if you're, I find, if you're the person singing on it to really enjoy listening to your own music with your own singing because it's, you know, when you hear your own singing, most people don't like the sound. Um, but with the <laughs> instrumental bits, it's easier. Uh, really? And I, yeah, I do enjoy Perky Pat. It's good, it's good, playful fun with lots of um, sort of retro futuristic keyboards whizzing around. Yeah. It'd be fun to play live for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. World War Terminus uh, has uh, some similar si sort of uh, sounds, anyway, to this mm. Infinity, uh, but it's it's its own track. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, that one? Well, the story for that one it's um, inspired by a Philip K. Dick. Um, well, um, Android. Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, which became filmed as Blade Runner. In that story, the world has had a, uh, a terrible war, but because all the records have been destroyed, nobody knows kind of who won or what it was about. Um, and, you know, the wealthy people can get off the planet and the everybody else is stuck there, eventually getting brain damage from the toxic fallout. Um, so that's what that story is about in a World War Terminus, the idea of the war to end all wars, which pretty much every war has been billed as, and it never seems to be the case. Yeah. Pretending to breathe. Um, some more great keyboards. Um, you want to talk about that? And it's yeah, beautiful, that's a, beautiful that's to listen nice. to with your headphones on. Thanks. That's another um, instrumental, and it's, um, I suppose it's a bit of a transitionary piece between different, we like to mix up songs with vocals and then the instrumental uh, tracks between them. Pretending to Breathe, um, It's a, it's got a bit more of an ambient feel than a lot of the rest of the album. There's some nice um, bass guitar towards the end of that track as well that uh, comes out quite prominently that I I like Mark's done the nice bass part on that. All right. Uh, another plague uh, addresses the fact that this COVID wasn't the worst. Uh, well, it may have been one of the worst in history, but uh, there have been even worse. Um, and yeah, I mean, the um, another plague uh, was written before COVID. Uh, well, it wasn't released till after COVID. Um, and the idea of that, the, the story of it is um, um, basically bodies start washing up on the beaches without faces. Uh, and then there seems to be an influx of faceless refugees. Uh, and then it gradually spreads as if it's an infection until you can't recognize anyone. And the, the song's sung from the perspective of a, a pathologist who's investigating this and they're expected to be finding like a, a virus in the face of the um, people without the faces but actually the virus is in the person perceiving view them. Yeah. yeah so it's um yeah. uh, uh, and it, it's that the, the more marginalized the person is the, the less us they feel the less you're able to perceive their face until it eventually spreads that you can't see anybody's face and you even look in the mirror and you can't see a, a face. And it, it's, it's the most um, scientifically, uh, I suppose, specific of the songs I've written in terms of my neuropathology background. The, 
you know, the pathology of it is actually quite plausible. The part of the brain that it references is the part that is heavily involved in recognition of faces and some of the description of what it might look like uh, down the microscope. But really, it's an allegory for uh, dehumanization of people who seem different. And we have a lot of that going on, for sure. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Yeah. Um, Refuge. Um, yeah, so that's the one, that's the instrumental that follows the story of my great-grandmother's life from um, uh, escaping, first of all, anti-Semitic pogroms in Eastern Europe, then getting to Paris, but then being uh, in the First World War. Then our husband enlists for the French army and dies fairly early on in the First World War. Then between the wars, she was um, dressmaking for the ballet and the opera in Paris. But then with, with the Nazi invasion, she had to escape the French Pyrenees, where then uh, she was uh, hidden and protected um, and survived uh, to the end of the war. So, um, yeah, so it's an instrumental. It's, it's it's the most classical piece on the album, although there are some drums and guitars in there towards the end. It's mostly piano and strings. All right. Um, the interlude is another wonderful instrumental interlude and uh, great electric guitar and drums. And... Um, want to talk about that one or yeah i mean it it's um that one doesn't have a particular narrative it's um it's another kind of fairly light fun one uh i like the guitar uh um, part on it it's quite fun um basically i think refuge is quite intense you know in terms of there's a lot going on um, you know, it's complex and uh, has a, a serious story to it. And I felt like it, we felt like it could do with a bit of a, a breather before getting stuck into the next um, very serious one. Yeah. So try and, trying to vary the mood a bit so it doesn't get too much of a hard work. All right, Lava Lamprey. Um, Lava Lamprey is a kind of sort of fairly playful, silly jazz rock type thing. The image in our heads was um, like a, a a fairground ride that's getting gradually more and more out of control until it just veers off and crashes. In the sort of narrative of the of the album flow, the idea is it's the you know, the overconfident uh, people and empires falling apart. Or, you know, getting, <laughs> now that you said that, uh, people getting too close to the lava. I don't know if you've seen some of the uh, people that confidently go up to take pictures of the. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. No. It, I must admit, the, the title for that. Um, there's nothing new. Not like the title fits the story. It's a bit silly. It was just the yeah. the, the just the phrase lava lamp, but then uh, oh, okay. it, that with a lamprey in it instead. But oh. it 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 doesn't have a narrative. Uh, you know the the title doesn't particularly fit the narrative. That was just a a silly thing. Yeah. My my first thought before I heard the song, the minute I saw it, I thought, oh my god, he's gonna hit uh, dance on a volcano from. Uh, uh, Genesis and there's going to be a lot of drums or something but anyway no. <laughs> you don't have to go down that road but uh, anyway that, that that's what it conjured in my mind when I first saw it <clears throat> but yeah totally away from what you're yeah. All Empires Fall uh, excellent great song needed to be said you want to talk about that one yeah, so the idea of that is that no matter how much power and money and influence you have, um, everyone dies. And although that's a great shame for the vast majority of people, it is also a great uh, leveler. You know, you can't take it with you. Um, yeah. Basically, all the, pe 
people who try to build these enormous empires and the statues to themselves, uh, ultimately, it's all going to crumble. Um, and unfortunately, also, the good things don't necessarily last either. But fundamentally, the whole point of trying to acquire as much wealth as possible is you know a, a flawed mindset I think and you know it's not fundamentally something that has lasting permanent value you know so that's what you know that that's what that song's about it's a kind of defiant thing of okay you can kill and oppress and invade but ultimately it won't last I thought it was timely with you know what's going on in the Ukraine and uh, mm. things like that. You know, uh, you know, here's a guy that thought he would absolutely wipe out this country, yeah. and he's finding out that that's mm. absolutely not going to happen. And in fact, yeah. uh, hopefully, we'll be done with him in the near distant yeah. future. Yeah, I mean, it was it was written before the the recent invasion, but. I wouldn't deny that the kind of mindset that led to the invasion is the kind of thing that we're that the song's about. Yeah, that, that those kind of people. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Cygnus. Um, the minute I saw that, I'm thinking the Rush classic, but it's nothing to do with that. <laughs> uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? So, um, I mean, all empires falls. It builds up to this. Um, this was Catherine's idea, actually, but that we ended with, you know, big choir of the three of us multi-tracked numerous times um, singing this thing, you rise and you'll fall, all empires fall. Um, and it's a fairly, you know, I think it's the biggest sound in terms of multi, certainly of multi-tracking voices that we've ever done. Um, and then that dies away to nothing. And then it's just, and then the Cygnus comes in just with, that was just recorded in one take, me sitting at a piano. Wow. Very, very little, um, you know, there's some reverb and things, but not much in the way of um, fancy production tricks. It's just pretty much an, uh, like an acoustic performance of a very short um, song. Um, so Operation Cygnus was one of these... Um, in like government war games where you, they, they work through a simulated scenario and their scenario was about a viral pandemic and various recommendations were made in terms of stockpiling um, uh, protective equipment for medical and, and nursing and social care stuff and then that it, it was felt to be too expensive so not these weren't in these recommendations were not all implemented um, then when we did have a pandemic, particularly at the beginning, there was a shortage of suitable um, protective equipment, um, you know, doc uh, doctors, nurses, uh, social care staff, trying to improvise their own, you know, masks or um, aprons and things. And unfortunately, large numbers of um, doctors, nurses, other healthcare, social care staff, um died while trying to care for others and um yeah something i feel um, yeah we had angry about really um because it was a i, I know you can say oh well, i'm not saying you but and I, I know it could be said oh nobody knew that this particular virus was coming that's true but viral pandemics were inevitable and you know it was coming up when i was lecturing before i you know, had to retire. Um, I was, was saying, you know, we, when we look at these previous pandemics, we are going to experience that. We just, we don't know when, we don't know exactly which bug, but it is coming. And I'm not saying that I was particularly special for predicting that. It was just, a, it's just an expected thing in the medical community. Um, but um, preparing for it was not, politically prioritized and people died um you know of course you know there will be some people who will die and this, uh, uh, um, that's tragic but particularly when you send people in to try and protect others without 
relatively cheap protective equipment. Um, and I think to many of us, it was quite, you know, offensive that the government was having this uh, clapping for the carers where people would come out onto the streets and from Downing Street and give rounds of applause for the NHS staff, which is, you know, fine. I, of course, support that. But then, you know, they not actually put their money where their mouths was when it came to providing the protective equipment that they needed uh, not to be killed trying to do their jobs. So, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I stopped being a practicing doctor for health reasons shortly before COVID uh, struck. Um, and, you know, I have a great deal of uh, sympathy for my colleagues who then I had to face a pretty horrific experience. Well, over here, we had all sorts of crazy. You had a, a yeah. leader of the government telling people not to wear masks, not to even, you know, fight COVID, just to kind of lay down and accept it. And yeah, yeah we uh, thank God that's behind us. Um, but yeah, um, this is the album. And if you haven't seen it or heard it, please give it a chance. It is fantastic. I don't think this guy will ever make a bad album, but uh, just, you know, two in a row uh, that I've really, and I've listened to some of his back catalog. I own some of his back catalog, but um, excellent, excellent music. Uh, they're a great band and uh, definitely uh, pick this one up. Anything else you want to say about uh, the Confidence Trip? Um, don't think so. I mean, the title track, um, the title track, I suppose, yeah. is a a bit kind of um, there's certainly, I think, a Marillion influence in that one. I mean, I do love uh, Marillion, uh, and I remember I was out with Mark. We were about to do a gig. I, I'm I often vomit because I've got I mean, I've got Ellis Danlos syndrome and it affects my guts um but okay. I still carry on doing my stuff but um we were just about to go on uh the stage uh and I just had to nip off and you know uh, uh be sick uh and he was getting worried we were about to go on stage and I came back and he's like you're right like, yeah yeah that's fine I've just been vomiting but while I was doing that a song popped into my head and I think you'll like it uh um but I'll, I'll kind of hum it to you after the show or something. Um, and uh, so we then did the gig, but I was quite pleased that I did remember, because often some, you know, a song might come into your head and you think, oh, I'm not going to forget that, but then you do. But that song kind of almost came fully formed, except the twiddly bit in the middle, uh, just kind of popped into my head. And um, wow. it ended up becoming the confidence trick. Um, and... Yeah, then I remember just before another gig, I'd done a, a very rough demo of it, and I was just playing it to Mark through the um, little speaker on my phone, you know, not not very high-end hi-fi. And, um, yeah, I was really touched that he kind of got a bit teary with it. It's like, yeah, yeah, we've got to do something with that. that uh, and then it became, like, the title track of the album. So, yeah, I was quite uh, pleased with that. And, you know, some some songs kind of pop out almost fairly fully formed just into your head like that and other ones take more work and that one just kind of felt like it kind of wrote itself for some reason definitely yeah mm -hmm. um excellent excellent album um and uh let's see uh, we've only got a couple more minutes and this thing's gonna stop so that it actually worked out great because uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. We'll have this stop and then we'll pick up and talk about Lovely. patterns uh, shortly thereafter. I don't have that one yet, but I am planning to oh, get... Oh, if I'm not... Oh, I must send you a code. For that. Yeah. Huh? Go ahead. Um, I must send you a code if I haven't sent you a code then. A uh, Bandcamp code. No, oh no, I have the... You sent me the 
the music. Okay. I have the music. I did the review, but I mean the physical. Yeah, I like. Uh, the unfortunately, physical. Uh, there's no and, physical at the moment for that because it's two and a half hours long, and it would be so expensive. I think to make a how many out however many discs that would uh, take, considering that my sort of minimalist music is even less popular than my prog. Uh, you know, it's a pretty small audience. It would be uh, likely to attract. Oh, do you haven't made CDs yet for that then? For the solo stuff, I haven't, no. Because, oh. I, mean, it, um, I was going to try to get it ordered, but... Uh... All right, thanks. I mean, I might, I might do for the next one because I've been getting more interest than I had done but um with this stuff so yeah maybe in the future but uh, also part of the problem is a lot of these tracks are hugely long and um sometimes one of the tracks is longer than a cd so um i would have to make the the album quite a lot smaller than i tended to make my solo albums to fit it on a cd but that's okay you know maybe do that next time all right, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, we'll end this and then we'll pick up uh, on, again for the second one and we'll okay. uh, patterns. All right. Right.